You're listening to God Stories Radio. God Stories Radio. God Stories Radio. Bringing hope and comfort through the Christian testimony. Welcome to God Stories Radio, Session 21. I'm Fritz. I'm Mike. Mike, I'm really excited tonight because we have some special guests here tonight. We do. Some very special guests. <clears throat> we do. Uh, you were actually able to attend the conference. Can talk a little bit about that. It was the Beauty for Ashes conference at Well, first, Real uh, let's go back to uh, how that even came to come about. The uh, uh, I never get Friday nights off. Jared from the church... Uh, sent me a, a link like about uh, th- three weeks before this event and put me down as being uh, the backstage for this. And I says, I can't, you know, I'll just let it hold on to it just in case if I have Friday night off or not. Didn't you kind of accept that position before you realized what you well, what you did? And then he sent the usual monthly thing after that, and then I clicked, you know, to accept, accept, accept. And I, wait, I said, wait a minute, there's an extra one in there. There's more than... I accepted too many, and I went back and looked at it, and October 11th was in there as well. And I accepted it, still not, you know, knowing what's going on. And then, you know, I felt something going on, you know, God talking to me, and, and, and uh, you know, something is coming, and I got Friday night off. Wow. So that Friday night off, and, and uh, I spoke to uh, Janet, who was our guest today afterwards, and, and I finally, re- you know, sitting there, I'm looking for something, why I'm here. You know, why was he there that night? And when she was giving her testimony, it hit me that this, that's why I was here. Uh, I know I was pretty excited because I got a text from you, I know, about midway through that conference that said, now I know why I'm here. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. It I'm going to let you introduce him, Mike. Okay. Uh, we have a special guest here tonight, Janet Dara, who uh, has a ministry called Beauty for Ashes. And uh, she gave her testimony a couple of weeks ago at uh, at Real Life, and her husband Mike is sitting alongside as well. So, Janet, let's hear your testimony. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, guys. Um, it's always an honor to be able to share with others how Christ has changed my life and how He saved my life. You know, I grew up in the church, was in church every Sunday. Every time there was a special event, my parents had me there. But somehow, even growing up like that in the church and hearing the message, I didn't know that it was a personal relationship with Christ. I missed it somehow. What I got out of church was I needed to be good or else. Mm -hmm. And so that was my view of God growing up, hitting, you know, adolescent doing things you shouldn't, and then I learned to hide sin because I was always afraid to be honest, and that's how I, that's how I lived my life. And into adulthood, um, I got married young, had a couple of kids right away, right after I graduated from high school. Married the first guy that said, I love you, because... That was the first time I remember hearing those words, and I thought, oh, my goodness, somebody loves me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I need to hang on to this one. So that's how I went into marriage the first time, which we know is the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Oh, been there, done that. Absolutely. Bought the (laughs) T-shirt. And um, was married for almost nine years, had two children, and I thought, this is my life. You know, I'm in this forever. And then that didn't happen. I ended up uh, committing adultery. I ended up asking for a divorce, and I continued to hide everything that I was doing. My parents still thought I was the good girl. I didn't want to disappoint them. But what I found happening in my life is the more that I did, the more sin and the more I hid it, the further away from God I was. 
through that time after getting divorced um, for the first couple of years, Mm -hmm. I lived a very sinful, very promiscuous lifestyle. And, but I didn't want that lifestyle at the same time. I know that sounds strange. About that time, I, I met a woman that I worked with in 1988, and I was sharing with her, you know, that I wanted a family. All I, ever, all I remember ever wanting was to be a wife and a mom. And she said, well, my husband works with a guy named Mike. <laughs> And, May um, I add that uh, <laughs> the mic that we're referring to yeah, sitting right next that. to me is from Solomon's Porch Radio. The other half of Solomon's Porch Radio. <laughs> and it's so good to have him. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and anyhow, she shared how um, he was looking for a relationship. He had custody of his two kids that he was raising by himself. And that immediately piqued my interest because that wasn't the type of men that I was meeting. So they arranged a blind date. For my 30th birthday. Oh, my gosh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And we have been together ever since. Yes, we have. And that was in? 1988. 1988. You know, things were progressing the right way as far as my plans were, because once I met him, I'm like, okay, I want to be married to this guy, want to have a family with him. But there was no way I was going to tell my secrets. So I went into the relationship still hiding all of my secrets. And just bef- just after I met Mike, I found out I was pregnant. And I thought, oh, I surely can't tell him this now because he's going to head for the hills so fast. All I'm going to see is dust. And I wasn't sure who the father was, which I was so ashamed about. And so I did what I always did. I thought, I have to hide this mistake, too. So I didn't tell anybody, and I just went to the clinic, and I already had my mind made up. To be honest about it, looking back, I don't know if anybody could have talked me out of it. Um, But I went into that. I walked into that building determined, and um, I had an abortion. And I don't remember a lot of details of that day. Um, One of the things I remember is after it was over with, I remember the doctor asking me if I wanted to know if it was a boy or a girl. And I said yes, and he said it was a boy. And I I just pushed everything way down. And I left that place and I thought, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm going to forget all of this. I'm going to move forward with my plans with Mike. I'm going to be a good girl. I'm not going to make any mistakes from here on out. Not too long after that, Mike and I got married. And I still, I still didn't tell him anything, any of my secrets. And then after we had been married about a year, I found out I was going to have a baby. (laughs) And I was so excited because even though between the two of us, we had four kids, and we were raising all four of them together, and um, we had two boys and two girls from our previous marriages. But when I found out I was pregnant, I remember feeling really excited to be able to have babies with Mike and have that experience with him. And But at the same time, there was a lot of fear associated because I thought, okay, I want this baby. I didn't want the other one, and is God going to do something to punish me for what I did before? But I still didn't tell anybody my secret. I went through the nine months of pregnancy. And when Elizabeth was born, and she was perfect, Mm -hmm. and I just thought, I don't deserve this. You know, I I don't deserve this. And, um, but I was so glad. And so thankful that God answered that prayer. And then two years later, (laughs) I got pregnant again, and um, we had Ben. And again, I still, I kept that secret. And I thought, okay, I have everything I want now. I had everything in life I wanted. I had a husband that I was crazy about. And I had three, three sons and three daughters I had the job I wanted, I had the house I wanted, I had my family and friends, but I was still so unhappy, and I went for counseling, and they said I was depressed, and gave me some Prozac, 
but things didn't get better. I still felt that same heaviness inside. Um, And I started thinking, you know, maybe everybody would be better off if I wasn't around because everything that I'd ever done wrong was always in front of me. It was like I had this list, and I could never erase any of that stuff off that list, no matter how hard I tried. And it was about that time that um, I got a promotion at my job, and I started working with a woman named Mary. We hit it off right away, and she loved me unconditionally. I didn't feel like I had to pretend to be something that I wasn't with her. She would she would talk to me about God, and she kept um, asking me to attend a women's retreat called the Great Banquet. And for two years, and then she kind of just quit talking about it. And the more time I spent with her, the more I wanted what she had. There was something about her that I wanted for myself. There was a peace and a joy that she had that didn't change based on what was going on in her life. And in my way of thinking, I thought, if I go to this retreat that she went to, maybe I'll get there what she has. And so I came to her and said, I'd like to go. And so they set it up, and I went to this church 45 minutes away from where I lived, completely cut off from the world. No phones were allowed. No, I didn't have a vehicle. I didn't have my purse. The clocks in the church were even covered, so you couldn't tell what time it was. One of the women at the at the retreat uh, called it Jesus Jail. She said, you know, we're in Jesus Jail. It was for 72 hours is how long the retreat lasted from Thursday night to Sunday night. And when Mary dropped me off that first night, I remember being in the lobby, and I'm surrounded by all of these women I don't know, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, these are all perfect church women. If they find out what kind of person I am, I'm going to be run out of here. So I'm already plotting my story, you know, what I'm going to share. Well, the next day, these perfect church ladies get up and start sharing their stories, and I find out they're not so perfect. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I began to think, wow, if God did that for them, maybe he'll do that for me. And so on Friday night, November 4th, 2000, um, I snuck into the chapel after everybody was in bed, so it was just me by myself. Jesus met me there. I mean, I can't, I can't describe it. Was, it was supernatural. I mean, I knew he was with me. I confessed everything to him told him I was sorry you know the amazing thing about him is he didn't out me he didn't make me tell anybody all the things I had done because he knew I would put up that mask and that facade again Mm -hmm. he knew the way to reach my heart and it was just it was private it was just he and I and um, when I got up off that I laid on the floor and just cried and cried and cried And when I got up off the floor, I thought, okay, I don't feel any different. Nothing's changed. I went to bed that night, and the next morning, one of the women started talking about the cross. And the tears just started to flow, and I knew. I understood then. And I was changed. I mean, I literally, I felt a weight lifted off. I felt loved. It was just like this feeling came over me like somebody just covering you with a warm blanket. So I went home. <laughs> uh, Satan got exposed, that. didn't oh, he? Yeah. Uh, they, uh, you closed that condemnation window Satan was uh, mm, using she, there. To, and she yeah. came home, like she said, and it was like we just started dating. I mean, she followed me everywhere in the house. Wow. And... Um, and and I just kept looking at her, and, and she was just different. I mean, and, and when I say that, I don't mean that in a negative way. She was just different. And um, she was real happy 
I mean happy to be there with all of us.